JD from the law school, and he doesn't practice either of those things. He's an entrepreneur and he's built uh, a, a number of companies uh, from the ground up and, and uh, you know, most recently has been very involved with battery, solar, wind, and other companies, but he's got a rich uh, history of, of dealing with um, technology and transition, energy transition, and sort of what's on the cutting edge. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Sean Cumberland from NCAP. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sylvia. Nice to be here. I, uh, I graduated from business school um, at the centennial of the university in, in 1883. The university was started in, in 1983 as my, my undergraduate um, here. And then I liked the school so much, I stuck around for another three years. I practiced law for the first handful of years in the 80s um, and then got into the business realm um, where I transitioned out in 1990. I've been in the power sector for about 30 years now, um, both domestically and internationally. So I've seen uh, a lot of changes that have occurred in the industry over that period of time. And, uh, um, you know, since I am addressing some students, I will just say my career advice, because I get called uh, from time to time, is um, be the kind of person that people want to work with. You'll go far. That's it. In, in just my 10 second version, I can elaborate on it. But but when I get when I distill it down, it's, it's really just be that be, be that kind of person. So how do we do the slides here, Sylvia? Um, uh, yeah. Okay. So first, um, so um, oh oh great great. And do I push it to? No no no. They're gonna run. Okay. So so. He really is high tech. Believe me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so um, I've been in startups and I've been in large corporations, but the last handful of my years has been in investing in, in private equity funds, first at Quinbrook and now at NCAP. So let's talk about who is NCAP, if we could turn the slide. So NCAP is um, a 30 plus year um, financial firm that's a private equity firm that cut its teeth in the, in the, in the 80s, investing in the upstream sector. They've raised over their course of that period of time, 22 funds, about $38 billion of capital raised in that. But, but you know, they, they were a, um, an established fiduciary of other people's money in investing initially in, um, in upstream um, extraction companies. And their modus operandi is to back management teams, entrepreneurs to go after some sort of strategy. It could be a particular basin, it could be a, a type of drilling campaign and a geographical region or whatever, but it was to back people and then sell businesses that were, were going forward. In the course of that, you know, they've actually serially backed a number of teams. And I think in their last upstream fund, half of the managers that they backed actually had been a prior uh, portfolio company, company for them. Some of them have been five peats where the management team have, you know, rinse, watch and repeat, been backed by them um, seriously. About a dozen years ago, they said, well, what's next? Um, we're, we're, we've proven ourselves for managing other people's money. Um, and they said, let's, let's get into the midstream business. And that's, you know, the, the, in, that's the uh, infrastructure area of, of the energy sector for them, terminals, pipelines, processing facilities. And uh, that went really well. Those funds have performed um, um, and, and delivered you know, outsized returns for the investors. And then they hired, um, actually they hired McKinsey um, uh, a while back to say, what's next? You know, we've done this, we've done that, what's next? And they looked at a couple of different areas. And one of them that they landed on ultimately was the energy transition. And you could say renewables or whatever. Um, and they, they, they hired a search firm and found a group of us, which have already been self-assembled to um, do this at a smaller fund. Um, so we had all been in the power and renewable sector about 25 years. There's four of us, and I'm one of the four, four partners in, in that. Um, so we closed our first fund uh, in March of this year, um, $1.2 billion, and you know, have been off to the races making investments right now. And I'll, and I'll, I'll cover some of that on the, on the next slide. Go to the next slide. Yeah. Great. So 
Here's what we've done. We've, we've made investments in six portfolio companies so far. Um, and if you think, you know, one of the founders of NCAP when he was on the fundraising, you go, wind solar batteries, wind solar batteries. And that's what he told the, the limited partners that we were pitching. And that's pretty much what we've we've done. If you look at these, these companies, um, um, we got into the wind space. A lot of us had deep wind experience and we backed um, a, a team that had been in the, in the wind development area for about 20 years. So we stood them up and created a company called Triple Oak. And what we've observed in the wind industry is a lot of the folks in the wind industry right now have gotten sort of mature and they're starting to let some properties go that they're, they're looking at the grass as greener for the solar business. So we think they've let their guard down. So we've actually backed this team to be more stealthy and finding opportunities to pick up and advance the development. It operates more like a develop and flip, meaning they, they accrete value by finding the property and then furthering the development, maybe getting a contract associated with it. We'll put you know a certain quantum of capital, say $100 million behind that company to go do that and then flip the, the projects out. Then on the solar sector, we're kind of like barbelled. Um, we also view solar as, as, as a long, long runway, um, but there are some interesting phenomena associated with the solar industry in that um, the barrier to entry seemed relatively low to develop solar. And so consequently, the, the capital markets have put pressure where that's, you know, these assets transact at single digit rates of return. So very competitive. And so how does a fund like us, which has told our investors we're a double digit return for, for their capital play in this. And we had whiteboarded this for some time. Um, how are we gonna do it? How are we gonna do it? How are we gonna do it? And the two areas that we saw were go large and go small. Um, so we've, we've gone on the Texas side, we've, we've backed a team called Solar Proponent and they're only looking at sort of the mega scale projects. So creating efficiencies from looking at, and th these may not be relevant to you in terms of absolute size, but you can think of it in terms of relative. So if, if a lot of people are doing 100 or 200 megawatt projects, then we want to do four and 500 megawatt projects in gigawatt scale so that we can eke efficiencies out and, and the pennies out. But we took a very long view that the property and the development of, of the solar industry was going to be huge in, in Texas. It's, it's, it's a great market. And so we piled in heavily on that side on the mega scale. And Solar Proponent is building up a very largest position in the Texas market right now. On the other end of the spectrum, whereas you know most of my career was actually developing large scale mega projects. Um, and, and my mentor used to say, well, you can't make money doing the small, but we've now seen with the cost decline growth of solar, that actually it makes sense to do it and push it out where the demand actually is. And so we did a, a, a we stood up a company called Catalyze that does rooftop solar for people. And there's an R square factor associated with the market size as the, as the price of solar drops, the contestable market where it makes sense to do uh, rooftop solar grows exponentially. And, and we've seen that this is a, a very attractive market. So we did catalyze. With the addition of all the renewables that are coming into the market, um, what we saw is that volatility was going to increase. You're taking baseload coal-fired power plants and gas-fired power plants, and you're adding an intermittent resource, the wind and solar. And so you needed a shock absorber, more or less, for the system. I've kind of simplified it there. So we piled into two big battery storage plays. And one of them is, is ERCOT, Texas, to the west. That's Broadreach. And the other is um, ERCOT uh, to the east. That's Jupiter. And right now, we're the largest financial investor in standalone battery storage in, in the United States. We've been very aggressive and we kind of tore up the business plan on how a lot of people pursue projects and it said, listen, just put the accelerator down, the market will catch up with it. So don't ask the banks for permission to build it and don't look for the revenue contracts because those will come in the future. And what we've seen is the exact, um, that that's exactly what's happened. Now we've also stood up a company um, that's in the fuels sector. Um, we've looked at renewable diesel. We, 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 just, we were really worried about that, but because of the disconnect between the, the ag fuels and, and energy markets and a, a small size of the diesel uh, side. So we've gone for a, a renewable gas and renewable um, gasoline play, and that's an Arbor gas. Right now we're doing our sort of science projects about what's next. 
And I'm really glad that the speakers are here because we're, we're trying to analyze uh, things like carbon capture, which the, the speaker from Shell is going to talk about, and hydrogen, seeing where those are going to come along. So um, I'm excited to hear what, what, what these, these folks from these venerable organizations are going to say. Let me just cut real quick to the last two slides as I know I'm, 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 I'm short on time. This is a slide that, that um, two years ago, then Dean Hartzell, now President Hartzell, was, was moderating a panel at the, at the Houston branch of the Dallas Fed. Uh, Professor Butler was speaking, and he put this slide up. And I've seen variants of this slide multiple times. I don't know why, it just kind of hit me that time when I was on the panel with him, where it just kind of struck me where I'm looking at it. And you can see over the continuum of time, that we, you know, as humans, we were burning wood and actually manure um, at that time as fuel. And then we discovered um, um, coal and the industrial age started. The first power plants were built in, in 1890. And then the, the boom of oil in the automobile industry in the 1920s. And I looked at it and then I looked at the year I was born. And I looked at the volume of these, these lines on the gray, the green, and the and the red, which are the oil, gas, and and um, and and coal, I said, "Gee, I've been around for most of that. Can someone do a chart looking at the other direction?" And so, if you go to that last chart, I asked you know some of our staff to say, "How much of total fossil fuels have been burned in my lifetime?" I'm 60, just there, and this chart is two years old. So over, I'm probably now close to 85 percent of it. And I, I don't know why I threw this up there. I was just really curious about it. Is that so what does this slide mean? And some people might look at it and say, oh, this slide means that, you know, we're doomed. We're, we're just going to be that we're stuck in this. And that might be one interpretation of this. But another interpretation of this slide might be, look how much we accomplished in such a short period of time. And if we are going to do the transition, the human the human ingenuity actually can change this right now in, in our lifetimes and the lifetimes of the people in the room. So it doesn't have to look like this, even though my grandfather is only 15% of this and I'm the 85% of it, that can change and it can happen in a much faster period than I thought. So um, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Denise, uh, or am I supposed to do the introductions or, well, oh, that, that would be great. All right, thank you, Sean. So. Uh, I'm Kerry King, a research scientist and assistant director at the Energy Institute. So we're proud to co-sponsor this event with KB, K. Bailey Hutchinson Center for Energy Law and Business. So I'm gonna introduce the second speaker here who's remotely presenting. This is Denise Nandurk. Uh, she's a senior front-end developer, development manager of carbon capture and storage projects at Shell International Exploration and Production Incorporated. She has 24 years of experience, 20 years with Shell and has worked in both research and development and development of assets and strategy assignments, mainly in unconventional resources, as well as, as well as working as integrated project lead development manager roles in deep water and enhanced oil recovery and carbon capture projects and technology organizations. So she's gonna tell us about Shell's efforts in carbon capture. Denise, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks everyone. And thanks for the invitation to, I'm honored to speak at this lecture. And looking forward to interacting with the um, other members of the panel, as well as the, the students in the audience. And I'm sorry I couldn't make it um, because I had some other commitments in the morning in Houston. All right, um, let's go ahead and start. Um, I think the, the introduction was, uh, was right on point. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be with you today. Because as you can see, uh, with my title, currently, I'm actually managing carbon capture and sequestration projects um, on behalf of Shell. And this is actually a, a new area for us um, that we are uh, putting a lot of effort in. So I will be happy to have some um, pretty good uh, discussions around this as well. So if we can get to the next screen, if you will. Thank you. So let me just start by talking a bit on energy in general, obviously, everyone knows this. Uh, so we need energy for everything, lighting our homes, heating our homes, cooling them, especially in Texas, our homes and businesses. Uh, we transport and connect people and goods with energy. We use this in industrial processes to manufacture steel, cement for the world's in infrastructure. Now, uh, of course, energy use goes very closely 
hand in hand with the activity, economic activity. It gives us opportunities for the growing population, uh, which was mentioned before. And obviously, growing population needs energy to improve their quality of the life. But we feel, obviously, like everybody else, that society faces this a dual challenge. How to make energy transition to a low carbon energy future to manage the risks of climate change, while also extending the benefits of low cost energy to everyone on the planet. Obviously, this is a huge challenge that um, requires changes the way the energy is play, um, produced today, used today, and it has to be made accessible to more people. And at the same time, drastically cutting the emissions, the carbon emissions. Now, what we believe is the energy transition is definitely happening, but we also acknowledge that it's gonna move at different paces and it will produce different outcomes in different countries, depending on local factors such as available natural resources. Obviously, solar was mentioned earlier. Uh, we truly believe that, but it just depends on um, how much sun you get during the day, right? And weather patterns. Wind is a good example related to that. And the second important part is the it is dependent on national policies that address climate change um, local air quality, uh, which I will actually talk a bit when I talk about carbon capture, how we really need enabling local policy, local and national policies that enable carbon capture and sequestration. And of course, it's also dependent on which technologies and products companies and consumers choose to, uh, to use. So let's move on to the next slide, please. Um, and in this slide, I'm going to talk a little about uh, what we do uh, and what is our ambition as a company. So you might have seen this obviously in public. Our CEO was pretty vocal about this in different forums. And we believe even though at, at a time of immediate challenge, we have to keep an eye on the long term as well. So for us, the biggest long term question is the one raised by climate change. And if we abandon that focus in the face of urgent short-term needs, that will only make the long-term challenges uh, harder to tackle when we actually lose the today's challenges. And we also believe that in tackling climate change, um, society is definitely um, focus is increasing on limiting the global temperature rise to one and a half degrees Celsius, which is obviously mentioned with the, the Paris um, conference. And we as Shell support this ambition. Now, we also believe that some of the parts of the world may take longer to reach that goal, as I have mentioned before earlier, uh, but many economies will need to act faster. Uh, as you know, some have announced ambitions to get there by 2050 or sooner if possible. And um, we recognize that it basically stands within a section of society that needs to move faster. And that's why we have set a very clear ambition to become a net zero emissions energy business by 2050 or sooner, if that is possible. And we will work towards this ambition, basically. Um, now, we also realize that um, we, this is a long-term ambition uh, by 2050. We also have a medium term ambition that we have uh, stated in the past. So we hope to reduce the net carbon print footprint of our energy products by 30% by 2035. Uh, so we upped it from 20%. So that is a very challenging ambition too, obviously. Now, this also means that it's not only uh, addressing our own ambitions, emissions, operational emissions, but we, uh, this also means we, we need to sell more and more lower carbon fuels, but we cannot achieve this alone. So we have to do it together as a society and customers and I, and that uh, customers and us. That's why um, we are a business that supplies energy, but we will work with our customers uh, to help them decarbonize. So that is our ambition. So firstly, um, how are we going to do this? We're going to be, we're going to try to be more energy efficient. That's what we're doing with our operations. 
we are actually turning to lower carbon energy products. And thirdly, which is my focus as an, an expertise, is by storing away our emissions that cannot be avoided. Because as you can imagine, we cannot uh, totally reduce 100% of our emissions, either by nat using nature-based solutions or by using technology that already exists to capture and store um, CO2, which will be the, the focus of my um, next, next slides. So if we can uh, maybe um, move on. So this, this slide actually kind of shows uh, how are we doing in, uh, in the low carbon world. Um, as a company, we are actually um, moving to a more like a gas business. So we are reducing the, um, the liquid uh, oil, basically the, the liquids in our portfolio and trying to be more gas focused. We're investing in new fuels. So that's a huge focus. Renewable power, uh, we are investing in solar and wind and you might have seen um, a lot of announcements lately related to that in the public. Uh, we are definitely advancing CCUS, which I will talk a little bit more. Uh, we are investing a lot in low carbon technologies. Uh, so our research efforts um, basically in Amsterdam and other parts of the world are towards that. So we also have some uh, ventures that we are investing in, uh, uh, solar being one of them. And we are very much into advocating CO2 pricing because we, uh, as I mentioned before, we believe Without the national and the international governmental policies in place, it will be very difficult to reduce the carbon emissions. And then of course, we, we are having a lot of uh, coalition type of work, working with different governments along this as well. So let's move on, please. Okay, so let me just focus a little on what we're doing on CCS projects. Um, so this is our world map and some of these projects have already been announced publicly. That's why like, I can talk about them. Um, if you look at North America as a focus, uh, so we have actually a, a Quest project, which is in Alberta, that has been operating for more than five years very successfully. And then the new project that we just announced a month, a month and a half ago is Polaris project, which is my project which is also in Alberta. So this is a carbon capture project and uh, storage injecting into a saline aquifer in, um, in Alberta. And uh, as you see the rest of the world, there's some other announcements we made, Northern um, Lights, uh, Norway, uh, as you see in the map with the Norwegian government. Um, Porthos is in with the Amsterdam, um, um, with the Pernis refinery and uh, um, the port. Um, and then we also have um, partnership with Chevron in Gorgon um, in Australia. And one of the uh, proprietary um, process that, that we use called Cancel is in Boundary Dam, as you can see with the purple there. And there's several in planning in Europe as well that I cannot talk about right now. D Denise? Um I, I'm sorry, I, I encroached probably upon your time. I'm just sensitive to allowing so that's okay. um, Will also to have some time to leave some for Q&A as well. Yeah, um, but, uh, no problem. I think that that was, uh, that was it. Maybe I have a few, but more general CCS related slides. You are you gonna introduce Will? Uh, sure, thank I you. Uh, thank you, Denise. So uh, I'll introduce our third speaker and then we'll have a short discussion and take questions. So any of you present in the audience that have a question, uh, write it down and be ready to ask it afterwards. So uh, Will Glazener is a consultant at McKinsey and Company based here in Austin. He leads the North American Division of Sustainability Insights. This is the asset backed arm of McKinsey's sustainability practice. He helps clients with their transition to a net zero economy. Uh, and he also has a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering here from UT Austin. Will, go ahead. And uh, in addition to being granted UT, I'm also native last night, so it's a real pleasure to speak with you about the energy transition today. Um, uh, as as Carrie mentioned, uh, we are working with the largest organizations in every sector and country on uh, their business challenges, and increasingly so, that's on sustainability, especially in the past two or three years. Um, and so, I'm kind of in the arena, kind of helping helping our clients think through the energy transition. 
Uh, myself, I contribute a lot to McKinsey's research on climate change. Um, we recently uh, published a report on, on curbing methane emissions. Um, but I'm here to talk about another gas today, which is hydrogen. Um, hydrogen is a really promising clean fuel in the energy transition. If you imagine an economy where uh, emissions are taken to net zero, the growth potential for the hydrogen industry is 10x larger than what it is today. Um, so if you think kind of about you know longevity of career in the energy industry, hydrogen is pretty high on the list. Um, and so I just want to talk about kind of McKinsey's perspective on hydrogen, um, its role in the transition, the competitiveness of it as a fuel, and some of the macro trends we see in the market. Uh, but I think first it's just helpful to talk about like, why hydrogen, why now? It's been you know, number one on the periodic table for ages, and it's not a completely new molecule. Um, but there's a lot of interest uh, in hydrogen, and it's primarily three reasons. I think the first one is that uh, we are taking decarbonization much more seriously today than ever before. That's driving, I think, what I call this phase of energy transition. Uh, the second is cost, which has been a uh, prohibitive barrier to hydrogen uh, for many years. Um, we're finally seeing breakthroughs uh, to make hydrogen more cost competitive. Um, green hydrogen uh, made from water and renewable electricity is kind of the cleanest way to make hydrogen. 70% of the cost to make green hydrogen is in the renewable electricity inputs. Over the past 10 years, we've seen renewable electricity decline by 8%. And it's on a continued trajectory over the next couple of years. So the cost component um, is really changing. And I think the third one is that we see um, companies and countries think about hydrogen in a very strategic way. Um, we're seeing countries build them, build hydrogen into their roadmaps. So we see that in the EU, Korea, China. And we see big announcements by, by major energy players around building businesses around hydrogen. And so I, I had kind of five kind of main points here. I was going to try to spin them in on each, but keep me on some time, Sean. Um, there's kind of five things about the potential for hydrogen here. So I think one is hydrogen is required for deep decarbonization. When you think about how do we get to net zero emissions, how do we keep the climate stabilized within one and a half degrees of warming. There's certain sectors where hydrogen is kind of our best shot to take uh, emissions out of out of uh, energy use. I think the second is uh, if you think about the growth of this industry compared to where it is today, there's a 10x growth potential by 2050. And there's specific applications where that potential is quite strong. Um, the third, low carbon hydrogen. I mentioned green hydrogen that can be competitive. Where our, our perspective and research shows that. Um, green hydrogen is going to become 60% cheaper to produce over the next 10 years, um, competing with uh, uh, fossil fuels, um, depending on the region, as early as uh, 2025 to, to 2040. Big spread, but, but it's become competitive. Um, what we see um, in the markets are uh, uh, companies wanting to make ecosystems around hydrogen. So it's not individual project developments um, from producers of hydrogen. They're looking at who's going to transport it, who's going to consume it on the end. And, and think about what's the ecosystem there and how do we kind of invest and build projects to do this. So we're seeing a lot of kind of partnership and, and collaboration in the hydrogen industry. And then the last one is that there is a strong determination from governments to, to support hydrogen. It's probably gonna be policy driven in the next 10 years, um, but there's strong signs of support from governments. If we go to the next slide. Um, so I, I just wanna draw your attention to the blue box on this page. So we've done a lot of research about how to decarbonize various economies. This is a, a piece we did on the European Union. Um, each of these boxes is a source of CO2 emissions um, in the EU economy. There's a couple of practical applications where hydrogen is kind of the best shot to take emissions out of, out of energy use. Um, where, for example, you need high temperature heat in chemicals and iron steel production, where you need energy dense fuels, such as shipping and aviation. Um, and where you can leverage existing networks like the gas network and blending hydrogen with gas um, to decarbonize uh, energy use in our homes um, are pretty promising. If you think about combining hydrogen with batteries, uh, there's even more options. So uh, it can be that a shock absorber and the power grid um, offsetting kind of the intermittency of renewables, um, and it can power you know, long range and heavy duty transport on the road. If we go to the next slide, uh, here's kind of a view of what, what could be. Um, when I talk about 10 times growth of the hydrogen market, it, again, hydrogen is an industry today that's used as a feedstock in a lot of industrial applications. But when you think about 10 times growth, uh, there's many more places that hydrogen could be used. So uh, on the right hand side for 2050, hydrogen demand, yeah, you see a lot uh, in power and transportation, uh, building heating and power, uh, industrial use as a fuel and a feedstock. And if you think about what does that really mean? 
Um, it could mean that hydrogen is 18% of our final energy consumption from less than 1% today. It could mean taking six gigatons of CO2 per year out of the economy, which is about 15% of our annual emissions today. Uh, the market could be $2.5 trillion, which if you assume that was all in the US, that would be about 10% of our GDP and it would create you know, millions of jobs. This is quite significant. On the next slide, um, you might ask, well, that's a nice picture, but how does that stack up to what's really happening in the market? We actually see momentum towards, towards that view. So um, two years ago, the number of green hydrogen projects announced to be online by 2030 was about three gigawatts. In the last two years, that same number of committed projects by 2030 has, has, has grown 15 times over almost to 45 gigawatts. So it's the same time frame, just two years later, a massive increase in kind of a pipeline of hydrogen building. There's additional kind of upside on top. The EU's been pretty kind of uh, uh, clear about their support of hydrogen. They expect to um, have kind of 40 gigawatts within the EU and another 40 gigawatts kind of neighboring countries uh, nearby. Um, and if we go to the next slide, can keep me on some time here. I want to talk about kind of cost competitiveness. Again, cost has been a huge barrier to hydrogen in the past. Um, that barrier is kind of being, being solved, especially with the cost of kind of uh, renewable electricity as one of the main inputs. Um, and as, if you think about building uh, many more times over hydrogen plants uh, in the future than we have been, the cost of each plant gets cheaper. And so the capex decline, the, the capital cost per plant is going to come down quite significantly. Perfect transition. This is, this is right where I want to ask a question, honestly, because enter the private investor, right? And so we've watched in the solar industry where countries around the world, and this is a question for both both speakers, Denise and, and, and Will on both CCS and, and, and the hydrogen. But we watched, you know, through different methodologies, countries in Europe would set um, um, high tariffs, feed-in tariffs that would allow people to build out solar and wind. And in, the, in this country, we, we tax incentivized people, in other words, to, 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 to put more out there. And there was that cost decline curve that you've alluded to, 80 to 90% wind solar and batteries um, on standalone side, we're, we're the beneficiary of the automobile EV um, that. So we, we didn't really need incentives on the battery side. Um, political plug here. <laughs> you know, we think it's, 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 it's arrived in that when solar and batteries are already competitive and don't need subsidies anymore, um, notwithstanding what's going on in DC in order to get implemented. Um, but for us, when, when's the inflection point for for hydrogen and CCS where it doesn't need government supports anymore to sort of break in and you say without, without that government support, um, a private investor would, would be involved in it and um, it, it would chin the bar in terms of rates of returns for folks. What do you guys think? I'll answer for hydrogen and then let Denise can comment on carbon capture. I think for hydrogen, yeah. um, what we see is, uh, we've done a lot of modeling to kind of figure out what this tipping point will be and when. If you think about hydrogen, uh, the production cost getting to kind of $1 to $1.5 per, per kilogram, it starts to beat fossil fuels in most major end uses. So think about steel production, ammonia production, power. Um, so once we start to see the production cost get to that threshold, you'll start to see the business case really, you know, pencil out for hydrogen. I think before then, we're already kind of starting to see a lot of tipping points that uh, are you know, indicators of that's on uh, almost inevitable, which is, these announcements that you see from large companies um, that are building you know, gigawatts of uh, hydrogen production uh, and getting you know, good returns on those, I think are early signs that you know, the, the cost of reduced hydrogen is, is well on its way down the curve. Is, is that, is that um, without government support, they're getting the attractive returns or they still need that, that support mechanism? Support mechanisms, they go a long way. Okay, okay. And Denise on the CCR? Yeah. Yeah, good, very good question. And this is something that, you know, as a company, we're also um, always working on, right? Because indeed, right now for CCS projects to be profitable, we need the government subsidies, whether it's a um, um, CO2 tax like, um, like Alberta, or, you know, we get the tax back with the 45Q for the US environment and some other initiatives um, from the EU government uh, in Europe, in other countries. Now, uh, the dilemma there is not all 
um, CO2 emissions are created equal in terms of capture costs. Majority of our costs in CCS projects are on the capture. So with the current technologies that we have, that's a huge burden, right? So if you have like some um, cheaper sources of carbon, like for example, gas processing or some from um, um, ethanol plants, those are actually in the right direction in terms of being profitable. If we can get the, um, um, the right place uh, for the, the emissions to be captured and also stored, right? So sinks and store, basically sinks and capture locations should be closer because pipeline of obviously cost is another big one, especially onshore. Uh, but we don't see the capture costs to go down immediately in the near future. Maybe if you're talking more like 2040, definitely they're going to come down, but it takes time. So that's where we are right now. And on, on the storage element of that, is there still, um, is there still room to go on, on lowering the cost of the long range storage or the risk associated with the storage? Well, that's a good question too. So for example, a big uh, uh, OPEX related to that is the monitoring programs that we put in place, right? Because mm -hmm. it's it's a requirement for uh, to get the ta uh, tax credit. So if those technologies come down in price, um, obviously that's gonna also help, um, right? Um, and then of course, again, like I'm saying, um, um, it's all about economies of scale. These um, more expensive um, CO2 sources may work out if you start small and keep adding, right? So that's another um, area that we're looking at. And obviously, if you go to a scenario where you store your uh, CO2 as a CO2 EOR agent, basically, you get the oil profit. But of course, as a company, we do not advocate that. So we are staying away from that. So we, we are mostly focused on saline mm -hmm. aquifer storage. Okay. All right. I might, that's interesting to note. I think I didn't know that Shell, I guess, didn't advocate for, or maybe is not investing in enhanced oil recovery. No, we are. We are investing in enhanced oil recovery, but we're trying to say, what I'm trying to say is as a, uh, as a CCS uh, angle, um, if it's our own field, it's an old decaying field, maybe we will utilize it as a storage option. But we're not going at, going ahead and purchasing fields, right, for CO2 UR. That's all I'm trying to say. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I might follow up with it. Yeah, it's just a question to the panel, and then we can mm -hmm. see if there's anything in the in the audience here. In terms of you know, sort of the the title of this session, perpetual transition. There's a lot of discussion about, I guess, the rate of transition from a public or environmental advocate side. The question is, it hasn't happened fast enough. Pretty much not going to reach 1.5 degrees C. It's pretty much baked in. Um, and then you are all advising companies or working with companies and making investments to make a, a financial return. What, what is the balance? You, do you, would, you, would you like government to push investors and, and incentivize so that the transition occurs for those who actually invest uh, and they can make profits? Or how do we view the, the pace of change here, right? Jean, you showed the how much energy has been consumed for people of varying ages and uh, alive today. Um, 2050s, you know, pretty short term to transform the, uh, the economy. Um, and, you know, to me, it looks like if you're going to get there, you're going to have to make a trade off in profits and the economy and things are really going to get shaken up. So uh, you are all very steeped in knowledge about the energy system. So how do you view this? What, I, what I'm saying is a challenge okay. the rate a, of change. There's a lot to unpack yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, first of all, let's you know, put it in context. Um, I'm a free marketer, and then with exceptions, you know, government can come in to help. But, um, and I think that by, by, by helping the wind and solar industry, it was great. It was a value served. But once it's done, it's time to let the markets take over. And so, you know, I think that, that these two technologies are at that point 20 and 30 years ago you where wind and solar, the, the two are talking about carbon capture and hydrogen. Right, go ahead. Right, so that, that's a place for the government to, to, to play a role. Right now, the markets should play a role with wind and solar, and they do around the world, uh, and they should in this country as well. We really don't need the tax benefits. But, but let me put something else in context. Um, the share of the U.S. GDP that's spent on energy, and I'm talking about 
transports, heating, power, everything is about five or six percent. About six percent. When I was in school here, it was double that. The, the, the amount of GDP that we spend on healthcare is 18 percent. When I was a kid, it was a third of that. And what we're worried about is spending a little bit on carbon, a little bit more on power. You know, when, when oil prices hit 100, you know, people go, oh, no, the sky is falling. We can't live as a society. Our, our economies will get crushed. <laughs> All this doom and gloom will happen. And I heard the converse when, when, when oil hit a, a, you know, $10. Oh, no, everything is going to go bad. I think there's too much fear on the, on the price at any given point in time in a commodity that is, and, and I don't want to say it's irrelevant, it's an, it's an extremely important commodity. Energy kind of drives everything, and it's good that it's only 5% or 6% of the economy. That's a good thing. But does it mean that we can afford to pay a bit more, whether it's socialized, which is what when government steps in and does is, you know, socialized, which you might say is a regressive tax on poor middle class, because you're not really making people pay the true cost of energy. Not a great policy in my, in my, in my view, but still it's important to, to clean the environment. And I think that's where government, you know, kind of can, should rattle the sword. And there's, there's multiple tools to do that, right? You know, one of them is you prohibit, restrict, tax, or, 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 um, um, or, or, or charge for, for carbon emissions. You know, you can say absolute prohibition, I'm gonna restrict how much you do, or you've got to you've got to be taxing it, which you know actually, if you say that democratically we believe there's a cost to carbon, then there ought to be a cost to carbon if we stack hands on that, right? Um, so anyway, I, I've gone off on, 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 on a rant. Um, so yeah. let me, let me get up there. Yeah. Denise, you have any comment there, and we'll go to Will on the page. No, no, I think yeah. no, no comment. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think you said the. the the pace of the transition uh, needs to be quite, quite steep and rapid. I mean, far beyond what we're seeing right now. If you take a, a you know, a goal like the Paris Agreement or eliminate one of the one and a half or two degrees. So we are talking about kind of a rapid increase in pace. And I think it's an all stakeholder game. I don't think you can do that with just the public markets, just the private markets, or without government. I think there's a role for everybody uh, in, in upping the pace. Uh, you know, if you're working towards this goal. Right. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions in the room, we have one from online that I can that I can ask. But if any of you have a question, raise your hand and we'll get to it next. So here's a question from online: uh, How can green hydrogen compete from an efficiency factor, uh, not even considering cost? And we have not reached 100% decarbonization from the electricity sector. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know. So how how do we see? Um, or other challenges for green hydrogen? You mentioned some cost trajectories potentially getting, you know, uh, reducing the cost, which is mostly electricity cost at this point uh, for green hydrogen. So maybe it's, you know, how efficient do we think we can get? Is that the metric we need to look at, or is it just the cost? And uh, what are the, do you know the technical challenges, or are they sort of business and incentive kind of? I think there are some challenges. I mean, it's, it's hard to look at a market that's uh, relatively so small today compared to the maximum potential, so there won't be technical challenges. Um, I think there is a new room for improved efficiency um, to drive some of the cost reduction, but I think you just look at the cost stack for hydrogen renewable electricity is the primary one there. Um, and the capital cost of building electrolyzers is, is the second. And so I think those are kind of the main two kind of the cost buckets to go after when you're trying to reduce the cost of hydrogen. Um, I think, you know, once you start solving through those, there's off, uh, obviously commercial challenges of de-risking uh, companies who want to produce hydrogen. How do we guarantee offtake? We saw that you know, wind and solar with, you know, 20 plus year uh, power purchase agreements that guarantee prices over a long period of time. Um, you know, those are examples of, of ways to kind of de-risk the commercial side that I think will still be challenges for hydrogen, uh, certainly in the next you know, five to 10 years. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm awesome, by the way. Uh, this question is actually for you, Sean. Given your background in, <clears throat> in power and utilities, I'm kind of curious to hear what your take is on how um, nu nuclear is going to fit into the landscape and the exciting developments around small, mo uh, small modular reactors. It's a great question. And one of my partners actually is a nuclear engineer. Um, um, and he gets asked this question quite often. Um, it's not the technology, it's the bureaucracy. 
it, you know, um, when you file um, an application to do rebar at, 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 at the driveway to a nuclear power plant, you, you're filing stacks and stacks of phone books to, to, to get rebar late. And, and you know, I, it'll, be, it'll be the NRC that, that, that is the bottleneck, not the technology. Yeah. Yeah, from, from the back. Uh, with a lot of the new exciting technologies coming to market, what I guess is the view of the interaction between them with batteries being, you know, uh, energy storage being such a driver for batteries and, and that's such a big benefit of hydrogen is that you can store without degradation over short periods of time. Uh, like what does that interaction look like down the road and it, or is, are there just too many variables to even consider those yet? Let me just restate that question for <clears throat> the recording and those online. So the question is, how do we think about the integration of all these different technologies, hydrogen mm -hmm. decarbonization, and yeah, what are the challenges there from a business or modeling standpoint, but anybody? It, well, it, it, it does require a lot of smart people to get involved in this, and there are. So let me just tell you, we haven't talked about this yet, but the renewables industry is one of the fastest growing employers right now in the United States and, and around the world. But, um, you know, we're, we're looking at multi multi um, technology projects right now where it's wind solar and batteries right and when we did when we would we did lithium ion batteries and they're lithium phosphate so they're not as dense as the ones that go in the automobiles because they don't need to be okay but they're cheap and safer um, we did those and we said let's hit the sweet spot the 80 percent application for batteries which is intraday you know and then when you look at hydrogen, you're talking about long, long duration sort of needs, which is the 20% of needs. And don't hold me to those numbers, but directionally, that's about right. You know, the inner day is important and batteries today, that technology can solve that. Moving the longer duration where you can do pumped hydro, that's great, but there's not that many places you can actually do it. So you're gonna have to find another sort of storage solution. That's why, you know, there's so many, so many eyes looking at, at, the, at the hydrogen economy, I think, right now. Yeah, I'll, I'll also add there, I, there are a couple places where you'd say all the clean technologies can compete against each other. There's also places where I can't predict the future, but where there already is somewhat of a clear idea of, you know, what the winner will be. When you think about electrification of our cars, um, you know, that's something that you don't really need hydrogen for. Um, you could, but electric, you know, electricity, battery EVs are a great solution there. Um, when you get into the power grid and how do we kind of enable um, the deployment of renewables or other kind of renewable um, uh, uh, forms of generation, um, then uh, to Sean's point, you can have uh, batteries, shorter, long duration, you can have hydrogen, um, you know, pumped hydro. There's a couple of different technologies that might say there may be different winners depending on the market. Um, and then uh, I'll let Denise comment on, on CCUS, but, you know, then you think about uh, industries like cement where there really aren't great kind of clean fuels and uh, you know, with the current technology, CCUS is one of the best ways to reduce emissions out of that sector. So there are the, kind of those pockets where there are maybe clear winners with you know, today's view of technology. Denise, any, any comment? Yeah, I think indeed. So that's something that we are looking at too, right? So how do we, I think one thing that we, we learned um, along the way with, um, with the CCS projects, it's almost like it has to be a blend of multiple things. Like one thing that we're looking at is more like hubs, storage hubs, rather than these individual small projects in different parts of the world. And indeed, it's almost like a um, like a mix. Like you may have um, cement manufacturers, you may have ammonia plants, you may have power plants, uh, more um, natural gas processing facilities or refineries, and then these hubs that we're going to build for storage uh, will be a blend of all these industries, right? Rather than targeting one, because if you if you do that. Uh, like I mentioned before, um, the cost is not going to be affordable, even with government incentives. So, Denise, I might follow up on that. I, I suppose mm -hmm. the biggest, one of the biggest demonstrations of carbon capture in the United States was the Petronova project uh, yes. west of Houston, and they shut that down. And I, if I remember my numbers correctly, about 40% of the capital cost was a government grant, essentially a federal grant. So do you have any takeaways from that project maybe it's what you just said but go ahead. yes i am actually very familiar with that project because that's something that we um, we visited we worked with um hillcorp 
who were basically who was the owner of the the West Ranch field where the CO2 was being piped. So indeed, um, so they made money with um, some um, indeed some government subsidy as well as uh, the revenue for the oil. But once the oil price started going down um, below $35 a barrel, um, the project became uneconomical. And keep in mind, Petronova had the, the highest cost of carbon capture, which is from a power plant. So that was the reason. So we know exactly why it didn't work. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm not right now um, too much tuned into what's going to happen next, because obviously oil price is going up. So maybe there's a way to revive that. But I'm not surprised they had to shut down because, because of the way um, the whole um, value chain was structured on. Right. So your conclusion was the technology effect in the storage that effectively worked as planned, but just the cost and uh, profit. Yes, absolutely. No, it, it did work. It did work um, um, overall. Yeah. Uh, I might throw it to the others, um, another topical deal with, and, you know, we always speak that there's three ways you can vote, right? The ballot box, investment dollars, and what you, the goods and services that you purchase. And you're voting every time you do that. And we've seen that translate into, you know, what people want to purchase in terms of goods. I mean, I was shocked when it was Budweiser that decided to, to go green. It didn't seem to fit the demographic um, for me. But, um, you know, right now in that first one, the ballot box, right? We see what's going on in, in the UK and in Europe right now with disruptions. So we have to temper, and I agree, you know, let's hit the accelerator, but we have to temper passion with practicality or less will you lose that first one, that first voter. So I think, you know, what, what are the, what will and Denise think about what's going on in, in the UK and, and, and Europe right now in terms of the disruptions of fuel and, you know, this, this element now? Yeah, I guess to, to my point, myself being a petroleum engineer, um, uh, that's my background, right? I mean, I started in the oil and gas industry, just, you know, doing the, the dirty work, if you will. Um, for me, I mean, and I mentioned before, it's not going to happen overnight. So we still, we are still dependent on fossil fuels for a long time. And it's, it's a good example, right? The Europe uh, being, um, and, and let's face it, uh, you know, for each society, it's a different type of transition. Uh, for North America, Canada and U.S., which, you know, I work with, obviously, um, very closely right now, we are still dependent on, um, you know, we, we, we have to um, air condition our homes here in Texas, right? And we have to heat our homes in the North and in Canada. So we need the, um, we need the fossil fuels. So the transition is going to happen and it's already happening. But I don't think it's going to be a clear cut. Okay, let's stop all the fossil fuels, right? So there will be a hybrid solutions. And that's why I think CCS is a great segue in the meantime, as we work towards these cheaper solutions, cheaper energy solutions and uh, cheaper solutions overall. Thanks. Any, any other questions? Sir? Okay, we'll take at least these two uh, in the front row to black. Sure. In the conversation with like institutional investors, are you seeing a range of how, I guess, desperate they are in terms of deploying capital for energy transition projects with respect to conventional upstream and midstream? What are those conversations that you like? This is an interesting question, Sean. Yeah, so um, the ask was in, in terms of institutional capital that we go out and raise money from, and you know, these are pension funds, endowments, sovereign wealth um, um, custodians of capital, high net worth individuals, um, other uh, insurance companies and other financial institutions. That's, that's the feeder that, that, that entrusts capital to us. And the question was, you know, are, what are we seeing in terms of their, um, their attitude towards this and the, and, and, and the push? In the five years since I've been involved in the funds management business and raising capital, I, I've actually seen it amp up. I've seen the exact same limited partner go from, you know, uh, gee, that's interesting. I better start looking at it too. It's an imperative, you know. And so I, I, I've watched the migration of that. And we've, we've seen funds, you know, we've, you know, the Harvard Endowment Fund this, this past week said after years of pressure from students saying to divest, now what, I'm not saying people should do that, but out of enough pressure, they succumbed to it, right? They said, well, that, they're, they're, you know, our, our base is saying we've got to do this. 
and the constituents that are behind a lot of the capital are, are, are driving it as well in both the public and private markets at the board level and then with the people that we interface with. We came out of the gate, just, just case in point, with this, this notion that, you know, what we should do is go buy existing old gas peakers. And these are plants that run, you know, five to 10%, but they're strategically located to actually make the grid have integrity because you need to keep the electrical system, you know, have its integrity or it falls down as we saw almost happen here in ERCOT actually. And so we said, let's go buy those and then hybridize them with batteries. So there'd be no additionality. We weren't going to build a new gas turbine. We weren't going to do this. And that we said was important for the allowance of more renewables. It facilitates more renewables. We had some very powerful LPs that say, doesn't fit on a bumper sticker, not good enough. I, I No, don't do it. Promise me you won't buy those. And, and we succumb, we succumb to them, you know? Um, e even though we believe that it was, you know, good for decarbonization, it, it, there is, and they, they come in different flavors, right? But, but what, what I see as a trend line is the ESG capital, the sustainable capital, is is a force that's still rolling and snowballing right now. No, go ahead. We'll follow up here and then take the final question. One of the one in my background of working in the cloud world was that the biggest bang for the buck in spending on generating reductions in carbon was it in North America? It was other places where there was much, much, much more pollution, much, much yeah, more expensive yeah. solutions. And is that a focus of the fund and certainly the kids in practice to, to look elsewhere for the, the bigger bag for the same dollar? And how do you really react to that? Let me, let me restate it. I think yeah. anyone can answer. Uh, where's the biggest bang for buck in terms of CO2 reductions globally? Uh, and you can think about it from each of your perspectives. Uh, uh, maybe we'll start with Denise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, sure. Um, yeah, I think um, overall, um, uh, the CCS world will be able to capture a lot of CO2 and reduce the emissions. But um, again, it's it, it, it just depends on um, still uh, quite a bit of investment upfront as we speak today. Um, maybe some some area that, that um, might be a good area that could be focused and it's happening already is the direct air capture. So that could be even easier to capture a majority of the, the emissions. So that's how I see. Well, and then I, I go. Yeah, uh, um, so you're exactly right. There are places outside North America where you get kind of biggest bang for buck. Sometimes we call that, you know, the cost of abatement a dollar per ton of CO2. Certainly kind of nature-based solutions, something about avoided deforestation, reforestation, soil carbon capture, um, which has the highest potential in equatorial countries, has a much lower cost of abatement than say, um, uh, you know, making steel out of hydrogen. Um, and kind of renewables kind of fit in between that, that crude spectrum I just laid out. Um, but I think kind of the cost to abate is one way of thinking about it. I think there is a need, especially in developed countries like the U.S., which is the number two emitter of greenhouse gases, to think about how can we actually prove out business models around new technologies before scaling them to other markets. There's a real value in kind of the order of operations of starting kind of in a developed market first, even if the cost isn't as kind of preferential. Because, I mean, frankly, nobody's operating at a system-wide level. And so you may just have to say, you know, here's the markets that we play in, and we start here and grow from there. A significant amount of my career has been in emerging markets in Latin America and Asia. I've worked from China, the biggest emitter, biggest country, uh, to Nicaragua, a um, really small country. Um, um, we, we, in, in Nicaragua, we did the first, second, third wind plant there. And we took the country after doing those, those, those wind plants from, um, a, you know, they were mostly importing their fuel um, it was um, uh, number two and number six fuel oil running them in old resip engines that were dirty. And, and so you, know, you have a balanced trade in, in all this in, in emissions. And we built the wind plants that were displacing um, fuel oil, basically. And that was a, it, without subsidies, it was a home run. 
um, from we just had a great wind resource. And so that took Nicaragua up to like one of the top five countries as a percentage of wind generation um, around the world. But it's so small, you know, I mean, all the European countries, but it was vying with them in terms of penetration of wind and the total electric stack. And so when Nicaragua went to the last sort of climate things, they were going, hang on, which year are we benchmarking off of? Um, with respect to attacking a market like China, um, and we talk, talk about a country, of, you know, a tale of two cities, you know, I mean, you've got, you've got the, the biggest renewables country in the world by far, and the biggest coal country uh, in, in, by far. And, you know, we, we could get in there and maybe influence Nicaragua a little bit by saying, hey, this is smart. Uh, uh, it's hard to, to go influence India and, and um, um, China. And that's where these global accords are, 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 are the perfect form for actually that, that low hanging fruit, you know, and that, that, that's the geopolitical uh, arena that, that's not well out, outside of my, my, my arena. But you're exactly right. There are countries in between where it makes, it makes sense. Our first fund, we limited to North America. Our second fund, given our pedigrees, will open the aperture geographically and we will go to Latin America and Asia for fun too. Man, stick around and watch. <laughs> We're at time. I think there was one question back here I said I would get to, so we'll end with yeah. this one. Go ahead. Well, these are good questions. Uh, a lot of interest on hydrogen and carbon capture. I think probably a lot of investors kind of sitting on the sidelines just want to see like, you know, how it's going to turn out. So how do you actually convince the investor to zero dollars on the line? Question mark on so if I understand the question, uh, still some maybe things to figure out in terms of system integration or technology or what have you for carbon capture and hydrogen. So how do we get investors to join in and speed up the development of the technology that everybody expects when you build more? How do we actually get investors to help build more faster? Anyone want to take that? Uh, you know, I mean, for us, it, that, God, it's squeezy for me, but that public-private partnership, whatever you want to call it, you know, subsidizing for a while, whether it's Section uh, 45 um, or other sort of systems, you know, it, it's going to be necessary right now for both of these. And so if they do find a way to slot in capital and it makes sense from a risk-adjusted basis, you know, because you have, a number of risks that are associated with these, but it's not like it's the first time it's ever happened, the public private sort of involvement. So you know, we're looking at it um, and we'll continue to look at, at opportunities like that as a, as a private investor. Um, and you know, that's why I'm, I'm really curious to, for, for these subject matter folks like Shell and, and McKinsey to be talking about this. Um, I'll just plug Shell real quick. You know, I get lots of calls from people saying career advice. I, I'm either early in my career or mid-career and I want to enter the renewables industry. And Shell is always one of the first ones I say, well, go interview at Shell. I mean, it's, it may be counterintuitive, but that is a, that's, a, that's a great renewables company right now, a great way to get trained because they're doing such, such cool things like this. Well, yeah. I mean, I'll just quickly add on top. I think, yeah, how do you, how do you mobilize kind of further capital behind the transition? I think um you know some degree folks are waiting for you know, the first startups or first companies to kind of break through the wall and demonstrate that it's possible and transparency around kind of the financial performance of the you know businesses founded on these kind of new climate technologies i think kind of goes a long way towards mobilizing uh, further capital deployment denise a closing thought we'll give you the last word no, I think uh, I agree with everyone, as, as you all know right now, um, as Sean said it very well, um, we need, we still need these subsidies and incentives right now to, to progress um, uh, the low carbon solutions that we're working on. Um, but hopefully in, in the next decade, they're going to be more affordable where uh, with the new technologies where, you know, we won't have to depend on uh, government subsidies. Okay, thank you everyone for joining. So thank you again to Sean yeah. Cumberland. Thank uh, you. Partner, NCAP, Will Glazener, McKinsey and Company here with the sustainability practice and online. Thank you, Denise and Durek with uh, manager of CCS at Shell. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. And please come to the KHC Club on October the 15th. Yes. We'll see you there. Uh, but, uh...